Hey guys, Mr. Klein here with our lesson on Athens and democracy. In this video, we're going to talk about Athens, the city-state in Greece, and the democracy it created in order to govern the city-state for about 100 years and its permanent impact upon us. Now, whenever we think of ancient Greece, we usually might think of, you know, things like Hercules. We might think of, you know, the, the Spartans at 300, though we'll talk about Sparta in the next lesson. They're not Athenians. In fact, they were pretty opposed to the Athenians for a good long while. And also things like the Olympic Games. Whoa, 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 watch out there, which actually this uh, actually wasn't from the Olympics. I just wanted to use this video footage. Anyway, let's talk about why this little teeny tiny corner of Europe, okay, it, even today it's one of the poorer countries in, in Europe. How did it have such a huge impact on the world? And that's what we're going to look at actually in this lesson. And throughout this unit, we're going to be talking about the Greeks. So even though, like I said, it's a teeny tiny part of Southeastern Europe, Greece is very important in the history of the world because of all the ways it influenced us. Now, pre Previously, in our studies of world history, we talked about civilizations that were based on large rivers. They, they were huge agriculture-based civilizations. This was not the case for the Greeks. The Greeks lived in cities that were separated by mountains, so they weren't these broad river valleys where huge cities could be built. Rather, the Greeks had small towns that were in mountains and valleys, and they developed a pretty independent view of themselves. They saw themselves as members of their community first, rather than being Greeks overall, whereas in other places you might think of the, in, you know, the Yellow River Valley, you might think of themselves as Chinese or Sumerians in, in Mesopotamia. Because of these mountains and this geography, it made direct trade between the city-states actually really difficult. But they still had a lot of trade and contact between the various city-states because they were on a peninsula. Okay, that's like an area of land that's surrounded on three sides by water. And really, it was really simple because they could just hop out and trade with other city-states and other cultures by sea. Okay? And as we look at this map of the Greek city-states, this is kind of at the beginning of the period which we're going to talk about, you see several of these city-states start forming up and popping up, most important of which is the one we're going to actually talk about in this lesson, and that is Athens. And in our next section, we're going to talk about the Athenian form of government and democracy. So the largest of the city-states in Greece was the city of Athens, which today is the capital of the country of Greece. And it was located on the coast of the eastern side of Greece itself. Athens had a large population and was ruled by a group of wealthy members of the Athenian society. They were oligarchs, okay? So because they owned most of the land and they were most, they had the most money, they thought they were to rule the city-state. Now, over the course of 150 years, as the city-state grew mainly through trade, the Athenian people demanded more rights to have say in their government, especially as trade made many people as wealthy in Athens as the ruler. So they were like, you know what, I got just as much as cash to throw around as you. Why should you be telling me what to do? Eventually, after a series of revolutions and bitter infighting, including a guy named Draco who would have you put to death if you were just standing around doing nothing alongside the sidewalk, eventually one of the oligarchs who took power, his name was Cleisthenes, and we'll look at a picture of him in a second, allowed all eligible citizens to participate in the city city states government in the year 500 BC. And that's this guy, Cleisthenes, right here. This is a modern day sculpture of him in the Ohio State Capitol. Cleisthenes said, you know what? Let's give all of the power to all of the citizens in Athens to make the decisions. And with that, the first democracy was born. And in our next section, what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk about the structure of Athens' democratic government. So how did the Athenian democracy work? Well, it was in many ways complicated, but actually very simple. And this is where a graphic organizer is going to be at. So I'm going to break it all down for you. Athens government was what we call a direct democracy. It's a form of government where all of the citizens have a say in how the government makes decisions. In other words, if you're a citizen, you could vote and whatever the vote of the people went, that's what the government did. Now, this is how it worked. Citizens met in the assembly in the Agora area in the center of the city daily to meet and vote on all the issues concerning the city-state. Okay, and this is a kind of a view, this would kind of be the Agora area below the, the Acropolis. This is like the big fortress at the, the top, and this is kind of what we would have thought according to an artist of what it looked like in Athens at the height of Athens' power. 
And so down here, the citizens would meet and discuss and vote on issues. Any citizen could stand up in the assembly and bring an issue for people to discuss and vote on. That's where we're going to start with our graphic organizer right here. So the citizens of Athens, all citizens in which we will define what exactly a citizen is later on in this lesson, met in the assembly and their job was to create the laws. So whatever the people talked about, whatever they decided on was what would happen. In addition to the assembly, it became very, very quickly apparent that just an assembly wouldn't work. In fact, uh, Athens had over 350,000 people in there. So that's like a pretty big city, even by American standard, you know, and having all eligible citizens getting together to vote. You can't just run a city just like that. So in addition, citizens formed councils and courts chosen actually at random from a pool of citizens who volunteered to serve. Okay, so they would, if you wanted to be a judge or something like that, you had to work in the you know, a city council member or something like that. In fact, apart from the generals who led the army, almost the entire Athenian government was run by citizens who were chosen at random. And from here, we're going to add on to this organizer. So there were two major things. Members chosen at random were of the councils. They represented smaller groups of citizens. And also the courts where juries decided court cases. Yes, trial by jury kind of got started with the Athenian. And interestingly enough, in some cases, the lawyers who would argue both sides of the case were actually the same person. Two, the two sides who were arguing, they'd hire a lawyer and the lawyer would argue both sides and then the juries would decide on it. And like I said, the only group of the Athenian government that was not chosen at random were actually the generals who led the army. They were chosen in the election by the assembly. Guiding all of this was actually a remnant of the old oligarch, was uh, the boule. It was a group of 500 citizens who served for one year and wrote rotated through the jobs and offices, and they ensured that the entire city-state's affairs ran smoothly. In fact, Boulay ran the day-to-day -day government, they came up with the topics that guided the assembly, and they too were chosen at random. Now this sounds really, really good. It's kind of perfect, you know, if you think about it. Everybody who could have a vote would got, get together and talk about it. Members were chosen at random, so you didn't need elections, so people couldn't, like, argue and be corrupt it by a political system and the processes. In addition, if you were chosen by random, you could only serve for an office once, so you couldn't have people with term limits and things like that, and the generals were led by the army. It sounds really, really good. It was not really. There were actually three big issues, and we're going to talk about the three big issues, what we see nowadays with their system in the next section. So like I just said, Athens' democracy had some issues, even though citizens had the direct right in order to influence the government. There were three major problems that we want to talk about. Okay, so the first one was this. You notice I kept on saying citizens and not people. Well, the thing is, participation in government was limited to Athenian citizens. In order to be a citizen, you had to meet these requirements. You had to be a male adult who was not a slave. You had to own land in Athens, so that usually meant you had money. And in addition, you had to have parents who were born and raised in Athens. Now, this was added later on in order to keep like wealthy merchants and stuff from claiming citizenship and getting in. So essentially, only a few people met this requirement to the point that some historians would estimate out of that population of uh, 350,000, only about 12% of Athenian residents could participate in government. Okay, so, you know, you mostly had like the wealthiest people still making the decisions. But on the other hand, it's way more than like, you know, you could have 6,000 people meet to make decisions as opposed to 50. It's improvement, but still not perfect. The next thing was all decisions were made by a simple majority vote. And the method by which votes were counted mainly relied on being able to count hands raised. So in other words, if you had a really contentious issue and you had 6,000 people voting and raising of hands, some divisions that were decisions that were controversial would be made and really close votes would be made and sometimes decisions actually might not have been made with a majority. It just kind of depended on the show of hands. Now there were other things where you would have pieces of plates where they would scratch their names but oftentimes it was just a show of hands. Speaking of broken plates and names written on them was actually this. Now the government had a method to get rid of troublemakers in the government. They didn't want rabble-rousers and people trying to cause strife and you know, their government. This is how serious they took their government. You could actually be put to death for not being a good government official. But 
As time went on, members of the government would use a method called ostracism. It was a punishment for troublemaking. And what they would do is they would ban them from living in Athens for 10 years, and they would use this for political enemies instead of people who were actually trying to block the government. And they would use this for political purposes to get rid of enemies. Now, the thing to know about ostracism was that you were kicked out and you couldn't enter the city of Athens for 10 years, but you didn't lose your property or anything like that. But whenever you came back, got your status back and it was back to normal. So it was used as a weapon to get rid of rivals instead of its purpose of getting people who were affecting the democracy and the fabric of the government itself. And so obviously there were some issues and stuff going on with Athens government. In our final section, we're going to talk about what actually happened in the end to Athens democracy. Now, despite those flaws, Athens government worked really, really well for about 100 years, and it operated at its peak. Generally, what we think of as Athens democracy at work was under the leadership of a guy named Pericles, and this is a sculpture of Pericles. Pericles was a great public speaker, a great political mind, a great general, military strategist, and all this stuff. Pericles helped Athens, and under his leadership, and with the help of their Greek city-state allies, defeated the Persian Empire. Later on, he built Athens into an empire and had it square off with their greatest rival, Sparta, which we'll talk about in the next lesson, and in the beginning of the 30-year-long Peloponnesian War. Pericles died of an illness at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War, and as a result, Athens democ didn't work work as well. All those political factions and arguing I talked about kind of rose up. And they lost to Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, who took away the democracy and put their own puppet government back in. Didn't take long before democracy was restored, but it continued to decline until it was permanently wiped out in 322 BC by invaders. Despite this, this brief experiment in democracy is considered to be the ideal standard for all governments to attempt to meet even to this day, even despite all of its flaws. We think Think of these great people, these brilliant minds like Pericles right here, standing and talking, talking about important political decisions and coming to compromises and voting on it, that every person had the right to get up and speak. Decisions were made by the people as the perfect form of government. But as we saw, Athens government had a whole lot of flaws. It didn't really last long, and it really only worked best because one guy they really liked stayed in charge for the entire time. Even despite that, it was better than what they had before. And in our next lesson, we're going to talk about Athens' greatest rival, Sparta, and how its government and society was really, really different than what was in place here. So there you go. That's the lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. And if, as always, you have any questions, please let me know, and thanks for watching.